We are continuing to walk through the book of Exodus. Um, this is part two in this series that I'm doing. Um, in part one, we looked at chapters one and two of Exodus. Uh, in chapters one and two, uh, you see Israel. Um, they've just kind of gone into the land of Egypt and uh, they are doing well. They are being fruitful and multiplying. This is what God told them to do. And it seems that because of this fruitfulness, because of these blessings that God is bestowing upon them, uh, that it comes to the attention of Pharaoh and uh, they become a threat to him. And the Pharaoh starts to subdue them uh, with great authority. He puts taskmasters over them uh, and they find themselves in this unhealthy predicament. They are, are, are in a situation that that they are uncomfortable in, uh, that they're going through all of this drama, these trials, these tribulations. Uh, and one of the things that I, I mentioned in this sermon is that when we're going through hard times, when we're going through difficulties, one of the things that we do is we just kind of retreat. Sometimes we get depressed, we get a, a little bit, I don't want to give my all. Uh, and in this scenario, we see two uh, s uh, people within this narrative, and we, we identified Moses' parents uh, and the, the Hebrew uh, midwives, who even though all of this was going on, they didn't uh, kind of go into themselves, they uh, still uh, surrendered all, they did everything that they could, they put all their chips on the table and said, listen, I'm going to follow God no matter what, uh, and, and they, they, they prospered because of it. And, and what we looked at, we looked at how the Egyptians saw uh, the, the, this uh, word ma'at, ma'at, which was to bring order out of chaos. And we saw how God was the one that brings order out of chaos. Even though the Israelites are going through all of this turmoil, that these, uh, the, the, the midwives and Moses' parents believed that God was going to bring order out of the chaos. At the end of the narrative, we looked at Moses. We were introduced to Moses because of uh, the, the parents. They had just given birth and we looked at that side. But I suggested one thing that uh, from Moses' birth, his parents saw him as the deliverer. They saw him as this godly child that was going to uh, free them from the oppression. And we looked at how even the Pharaoh was being used by the devil to try and kill all of the male child because there was this rumor going around that there was going to be this deliverer. Moses believed that he was this deliverer. He grew up believing that. And so by the time he gets to uh, the end of chapter 2, uh, Moses sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And because he believes that he is Mayat, he is going to be the one that brings order out of the chaos. He kills the Egyptian, which sends him on the run. And that's where we pick up part two. Moses is now in a totally different environment to what he envisioned for himself. Moses was a high flyer in society. Moses uh, was going to be Pharaoh Moses the first. He was going to be uh, this high and lofty individual. And so throughout his upbringing, I can just imagine that, you know, when you go to university, there are certain people that you can just say, oh, this person is going to do well. This person is highly educated. I can see this person is, is destined for greatness. Uh, I can just imagine that's how everybody viewed Moses. Moses was a high flyer in society. Everybody knew Moses' name. Not only was he highly educated, but Moses would have won multiple military battles. And so when Moses is walking down the street, I can just picture in my mind's eye, people high-fiving Moses. Hey, Moses, how you doing? You all right? Good looking out, Moses. All right, Moses. Moses is that guy. Moses is destined to be a great man. And all of that is flipped on its head in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when Moses does something that he was not meant to do. Because Moses felt, well, hold up, I am Matt, I am going to be the one that brings order to this chaos. And he does this and he has to go on the run. And so now Moses finds himself living in the wilderness. You have to understand there, there is a stark contrast to where Moses thought his life was going to be to where he ended up. Have you ever been in that situation where you have dreams and visions for yourself of where I want my life to go? I have plans. This is the direction that I want to go. But suddenly you find yourself in the totally other, 
extreme. As a young man, let me say younger man, I had a dream for myself. And my dream was this. I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. That was my dream. And, and, and I had this, 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 this plan. I, I, I was very much, yes, I, I, this is where I want to go. This is how I want to do things. Uh, 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 but then there is a flip. There is this change. And what happens is Moses finds himself in the wilderness. And I want to say this to you. Uh, Moses finds himself in the wilderness, uh, which is I call the university of God. Uh, the wilderness is this, is this place where God wants to uh, get you to a place where you can hear him. And sometimes when your, your direction, your plans, your, your high and lofty uh, plans of just sustaining yourself, uh, you can't hear God's voice. And so God needs to put you in the wilderness. He needs to put you in this environment so that you can hear him. And so here Moses is, he's in this university of God. He's in this place where uh, God wants to basically kind of strip him down so that he can hear the directions that God has for his life. Now Moses is in a totally different place. Uh, uh, one of the best cinematic productions of this narrative, I think, was done by Cecil B. DeMille, The Ten Commandments. I think that he, 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 he shows the narrative so well, but there is one part that I'd like to suggest that I, I think he kind of got it wrong. You see, uh, uh, when you look at the movie, uh, Moses has this beautiful lady, uh, this Egyptian lady that was bound to be his wife, and, and she looked good, man. She dressed in silk. She had her eyes painted, you know, her, her skin was soft and you could see that from the cinema screen. You, you know, she, she just looked really nice. But then Moses goes into the wilderness and he marries Zipporah. And from Cecil B. DeMille's description or depiction, she weren't that bad. But I'd like to propose to you that, you know, women that are living in the wilderness, you know, they ain't bathing their skin in... In Olavule, you know, their skin is not as, as soft as those in Egypt. And, and so even, uh, you know, even when you're talking about the women that Moses would have had in, in Egypt, he, he had this lofty vision. But then he comes into the wilderness and he has to settle. Moses' life is not the way he intended it. But when you step into this university of God, when you step into this place where God wants to bring you closer so that you can hear him, sometimes he needs to strip everything away from you. I am an alumni of the university of God. I, I, I told you I, I had this vision of, 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 of being a millionaire by the time I was 30. And I was, let me say I was on my way I wasn't on my way, but I was, I was on the path. I was, I was in the right direction. I was, I was living in Germany, and I was working for the European Central Bank, and I was earning lots of money. And I'm in this wilderness of God where everything has kind of been stripped away from me. Uh, uh, everything uh, that I'm used to, the customs, the friends, everything is gone because when you're in this university, God wants you to, to, to listen to him. And God comes and, and he speaks to me and he says, listen, um, I want you to work for me full time. Oh, ah, man, Lord, uh, I, 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 I don't know if I want to do that pastoring thing, you know. Look. But here, here, here is what happens when you're in the university of God. And so here Moses, he, 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 he. He is not where he wanted to be. He had great plans. He had great plans for himself. And now he finds himself in the wilderness. I can just picture in my mind's eye how uh, one of Moses' university friends may have come along. And they're, they're saying, hey, Moses, how, hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you in ages. What, what are you doing now? I, I, what, 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 what happened? He's, Moses is like, oh, I'm a shepherd. Oh, you're a shepherd? Oh, oh okay. Didn't expect that one, Moses. Okay, but man, I knew that you, you, you must have so much flock. You must have so much land. And Moses, like, well, uh, I'm kind of looking after my father-in-law's sheep. 
Because Moses is not where he wanted to be. And so Moses is tending flock for his father. Moses is broke. He's lost his skills. And understand this, when Moses left Egypt, he was 40 years old. When he killed the Egyptian, Moses was 40. He was in the prime of his life. He was good, strong. He had everything going for him. Now when we pick the narrative up, Moses has been living in the wilderness for 40 years. Sometimes it takes God 40 years for you to unlearn the things that you have learned. For you to be able to hear him. Sometimes when we're going through these uh, dramas or these difficult times in life, uh, we have to look at what lessons are, 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 are we trying to be gleaned from this? What, what is God trying to tell us? And here Moses has been in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses is there, he's tending his, his flock. And out of the corner of his eye, he notices something. He, 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 he sees this, this bush that is burning. I can imagine maybe Moses has seen bushes burning in the wilderness many times, and so he doesn't really pay it much attention. But then a few seconds later, Moses turns back and sees the same bush still burning. This shrub. What's going on? Have any of you ever burnt a shrub or a bush? So, we always get these Christmas trees every year in my house. And instead of taking them to the dump and getting all the pine needles in my car, I decided to burn them. So for the last few years, I've been burning my Christmas tree. Now, the first time I did this, I built up the fire in my garden, and I just got the tree, and I chucked it on. FYI, don't do that. Because literally, the tree just, it's like, whoosh, it just goes straight up. And within a few seconds, it, the, all the pine needles have kind of burnt themselves out, and then it just starts to simmer down and so forth. But I remember saying to my wife, I was like, man, Whose idea was it to put Christmas trees in your house? This is highly dangerous. If, if your tree catches fire in your house, it's game over. And so I can imagine Moses sees this shrub that's burning and, and he doesn't pay much attention. But as he goes back, he, he sees this tree is still burning. And so he starts to go closer. And this is where he hears the voice of God. And, and, and God says this, Moses, Moses. David Asherick preaches this fantastic sermon about when God calls your name twice. He, he's literally trying to say to you, listen, your, your concept of what reality is, is warped. And I need to change your concept of what reality is into making it be in line with what I want my will to be for your life. And he's basically coming from the aspect of Saul on the road to Damascus. And he says, Saul, Saul. But... That's another sermon. Moses, Moses. Take off your feet because the place you're, take off your shoes because the place you're standing on is, is holy ground. Moses takes off his shoes and, 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 and God starts to have this conversation with Moses. Chapter 3, verse 8. I'm going to read verse 8 and I'm going to read verse 10. And this is, what, this is what God says to Moses. So Moses, I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptian and bring them out of the land into good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 10. So Moses, now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh, to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Let's just pause here for a moment and look at the situation that we're in. Moses is no longer a young man. Moses is 80 years old. 
When I preached this in the morning, I said to the, to the people in early service, I said, listen, Moses would be coming to the early service. Moses is 80. Moses has no strength. He's probably lo lost all of his uh, military training, his, his skills. I don't know if he can read hieroglyphics or whatever else. But Moses is now an old man. If there's anybody I want to go and bring the people out of Egypt, Moses is not that guy. He's not. But here's the interesting thing. God seems to always choose people that we would not choose. God seems to call people that don't seem to have the skills that we would deem necessary to do that job. Each and every one of you has been called by God to do something. How do I know that? Because we're all part of the body of Christ. And so we're all supposed to do something. Doesn't mean you need to be up here preaching or teaching or whatever else. But the body needs to function in unison and everybody has a part to play. So everybody is called to do something. Now the problem is, is when we're looking for people to do that something, we have a list of criteria. we have a job description that you need to fulfill. Okay, in order to do this, I'm looking for somebody that has this, this, this and this and this. And so when we are called to do something, a lot of time we're saying, well, oh, I don't have this, 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 so I can't do it. But when you look at what God does, God never calls people with any skills whatsoever. Moses is the last person. You know, I could even understand God, you know what? If you'd called Moses 40 years earlier, that would have been, that would have been perfect. That, he would have been wrecked, oh, he would have been there. But God doesn't do that. If you fast forward a couple chapters to Judges, uh, the Israelites are in captivity and Jesus, God, and he needs to send somebody and he goes to Gideon. Oh, he goes to Gideon and he says, Gideon, listen man, I need this mighty man of valor. The problem is when God goes to Gideon, Gideon is hiding because he is so scared. Lord, why are you going to Gideon? if you need a mighty man of valor. Even Gideon is saying, Lord, uh, I think you maybe got the wrong house. I'm, I'm not the man for the job. Samuel. God says to Samuel, listen, I need you to go anoint the next king of Israel. Samuel goes into Jesse's house and he sees the eldest son and he says, ah, oh, surely this is the man. This is the man. This has to be the man because you know what? He has all of the worldly characteristics that I think a king should have. He's strong. He's tall. He's got muscles. But God says, no, 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 no. Not him. In fact, God says, David, David, who Jesse doesn't even feel is worthy to be invited into the house. That's how insignificant David was. But that's the person that God chose. And we're all like, but why David? You don't have the characteristics, you don't have the qualifications that is necessary. Why are you calling this individual? And sometimes God just goes right to the other extreme. Because you know when Joshua is spending, sending spies to Jericho, and, and he needs somebody to help out, he goes to Rahab. Rahab. Rahab was a woman of the night. A scarlet woman. A street walker prostitute she was a hoe and that's who God used this is somebody that many of us wouldn't even want to talk to we wouldn't even want to associate ourselves with but God is using people that we wouldn't even think of and the funny thing is is this is that she finds herself in the lineage of Christ God seems to be using people that we don't think can be used. He always uses the people that, uh, that man doesn't see. And so here, even though Moses, he, he has no, uh, there's no reason why God should be calling him. But God is calling him. And the thing is, is because we think like this, there is this set of skills, there is a set of qualifications that we need. Uh, because we think like this, when, when God actually does call us, we doubt our ability to do it. Ah, uh, I don't think I can do it. I'm, I'm. 
So here God is going to Moses. And you know what? For me, I think Moses has his own, he's got his own plans. Moses' plans for his own life has just not worked out. And so for me, uh, I think Moses is all about trying to invest in his children now. All the things that I wasn't able to accomplish, I want that for my children because that's what we do as parents, isn't it? Anything that I wasn't able to accomplish, I want my children to fulfill. As a child growing up, my dad used to teach me piano. And I hated it. And you know what I hated the most? Practicing. If you want to become good at anything, you have to practice. And I hated practicing. I hated it. My dad, go and practice. And I hated it. To the point my dad was fighting with me for so long. Listen, you need to practice. You need to practice. It got to a point where my dad sat me down. He said, listen, if you don't want to play the piano anymore, you can give up. But he said, listen, know this. You will regret it. At about 10 or 11, I jumped off the piano stores like, yeah, right. See you later. <laughs> I went outside to play and I was like, yay, play. And then you grow up and I regret it. I regret it. It's a skill that I, I just don't have and I wish I did. So as soon as my eldest daughter was born, I bought myself a piano. My piano sitting in my house, I can't play it. And I remember going around to everyone, okay, uh, can, can you teach my daughter to play the piano? And I'm like, oh, okay, how old is she? I'm like, oh, she's one. <laughs> because that's, that's, a, that's a dream I wasn't able to fill within my own life. And, and my wife will tell you, my kids will all be musicians. There, there's no sucking, there's no, oh, if you don't want to practice. They will practice. So I can imagine that Moses has all of these things that he wasn't able to do within his own life. And so now he's like, wow, okay, I need to make sure that my kids can do this. And in the midst of that, he has a plan for his life. He knows where he wants his kids to go. God now says, Moses, Moses. I, I, I want you to go and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Oh, Moses, ah, whew, Lord, ah. And Moses now comes with four excuses as to why he is not the right candidate for the job. And I want to suggest to you that I think this is what we do. When we are called to do something, when we are offered to do something, we come up with excuses as to why we can't do it because we are looking at these list of qualifications that the world or man has put in place that that is what is needed. And so Moses, first of all, he comes and he says, um, Lord, who am I? Who am I? Lord, if you'd come 40 years ago, I, I, I could have, you know. But Lord, you know, every morning I wake up, man, my sciatica is killing me. I have to uh, scratch my back, Lord, you know. I can barely walk five miles with it, Lord, and you want to send me? Lord, who am I? The interesting thing, this is what we do. We're saying, oh, I'm not the right person. Why are you sending me? But you know what? If God is calling you, then surely God knows. You're the person I want. Next question, Moses. Moses asks, is saying this, verse 13. Moses says to God, and it's interesting, I love this, this correspondence that Moses has with God. And the willingness for God to answer him. You know, I, I don't have conversations with my children. I told you to go do something, why am I speaking to you twice? But God here is conversating with Moses. And so Moses is saying, suppose I go to the Israelites and the God of your, saying the God of your fathers has sent me. And they say, well, what is his name? Here Moses is basically saying, Lord, I don't have all the answers. What if I go and they're asking me questions that I can't answer? What, what do I do? 
And I hear this from us all the time. Oh, do you know what? I don't know my Bible that well. I can't do this. And uh, what if they ask me this and so forth? And, and Moses is basically saying the same thing. Then when you go to chapter 4, Moses says this. What if they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? The interesting thing is when you look at the response that God gives in, uh, to Moses to the second question, is Moses, uh, God says in chapter 18, he says, the elders of Israel will listen to you. God has already said they're going to listen to you. God has already given Moses the description of how he's going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses is coming with the what-if monster, I'd like to call it. The what-if monster is this hypothetical scenario that doesn't actually exist. But we're making it up, we're making these scenarios up in order to try and justify our rationale for not doing something in the first place. Well, you know, what if I drive there and my car blows up? What if I don't have enough money? What if I don't have enough time? What if, what if, what if? This what-if monster. And the last thing Moses comes up with is saying, well, Lord, you know, I, 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 I'm not, 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 not re re really a good, 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 good speaker, and I stammer. We come up with all of these uh, excuses as to why I cannot fulfill this role. And the interesting thing is God actually answers every single question that Moses poses. And it gets to the point where Moses just says, look, Lord, please, send someone else. And the interesting thing is, is that I can relate to this because when I was in my university of God, when God arrested me, when God said to me, Andrew, Andrew, I want you to work for me full time. This is, I, I want you to be a minister. I want you to go into gospel ministry. My response to God is, but people aren't going to take me seriously. What, what, if don't, what if people don't listen to what I have to say? You know, I was, I was the class clown. I was the joker. I was doing stand-up comedy. That's how people viewed me. They viewed me as this comedian. And now you want me to get up and, and talk to people and preach to people? Ah, oh, Lord, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And then it's like, well, why me, Lord? Oh, I don't know if this is for me. Lord, I'm not a good speaker. I don't like preaching. I, I, Lord, oh. We come up with all of these excuses. Until the point Moses just says, please send someone else. But watch this. And I think we may have missed it in the reading. Because the first time I read it, I missed it. This is what God is saying. Chapter 3, verse 8. Don't miss this. God is saying to Moses, Moses, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. So, verse 10, I am sending you. Did you get it? God is basically saying, listen, I am coming down to deliver my people. I'm the one that's going to do it. All I need you to do it's going to be my hands and feet. All you need to do is bring them out. I'm going to do the delivering. I'm the one that is going to rescue them. And so therefore, I don't care about your qualifications. You don't need to be a young man. You don't need military training. You don't need to have anything beneath you except for faith in me. Because you know what? I'm going to do it. All I need is hands and feet so that you can bring, bring them out. That's all that I need. And so when you look through the Bible, all you're seeing is people and individuals who have been willing to follow the voice of God. Because you know what? That's all God needs. And I think a lot of the time when if people come with their own qualifications, sometimes you can 
start to get a little bit boastful. It's like, yeah, this, that's what I did because I'm, I'm really that good. And so God doesn't want people like that. God wants people to, that literally when you do something, everyone just says, man, that can only be God. Nobody looks at Moses and says, wow, Moses, you know what, you, you, you had good training. That, that, Moses had nothing. It was simply God. When God calls you to do something, he will equip you with everything that you need in order to do that. All God wants from you is to be willing. But a lot of the time, it's this criteria that man has put in place that, that really hinders us from actually fulfilling what God wants us to do. There are times I stand up here and I preach and someone comes up to me after and they'll say, listen, pastor, I want to be baptized. That has nothing to do with my preaching skills, my oration, because you know what? I don't think that I have these skills. It's all God. God has empowered me. God has blessed me in my ministry. God has seen me through some tough times simply because that's who he is. He's seen the path that he wants me to walk down and I've had the courage to walk down it. Whatever God is asking you, whatever God is calling you to do, whatever it is, don't let circumstance situations hinder you from walking through that door because you know what God has already ordained that path he knows how he wants to use you and you just need to wait he has already come down he will do the delivering he's just sending you to be his hands and feet that's the beauty of God so my appeal is this this is my appeal and I close my appeal is that everybody in here knows their calling because I believe that God has called each and every one of us and it, 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 this is the beauty about the, about the Christian church we all have different gifts different functions God is calling you he wants to use you in a special way that you walk into that gifting that you allow God to use you to bring people out he's already delivered them he just needs you to bring them out.